Good evening, this is the Oscar Expert here with Brother Bro, and it's time to cringe at our past Oscar predictions. You know, I really like to scrutinize my predictions. I want to see everything coming. That's what I want. How do I see, how do I gain insight by looking into the past to understand my present? How much confidence should I have in my predictions? And actually, when you look in the past, you understand that you should not have confidence in your predictions right now. We're gonna try to learn lessons but at the end of the day, really, every season is different. Every movie is different. It's like, oh, yeah. this is this year's Power of the Dog, and this is this year's Nightmare Alley, and like, it's not, it doesn't really work that way. Not only are we gonna watch our oldest predictions video, but I did compile all the predictions we made throughout the whole year, so we can tr tr uh -huh. track the evolution, and I also have the percentage right that we got every month. Number one is Babylon. You know, this did test screen. I didn't see it or anything, but there have been reports released and- Here, Here's something interesting. I feel like with Babylon, like when you when you pull away lessons, when the trailer came out, there wasn't goodwill for it and it felt like people were already polarized about the movie and that was just true about the reception. Remember yeah. the teaser for The Sun, which we're obviously gonna talk yeah. about? Yeah. I remember that was yeah. like, is this gonna be a Lifetime movie? Nah, this is just a bad teaser. But people just get like a vibe and a feeling for the movie like right when the trailer drops and you know, they just know if they like it or not. I mean, I liked the trailer, but it did yeah. show that it was a crazy movie and maybe it would and be And people were like, do we need this? I mean, the overall sentiment about Babylon was that it was just like, why? What's the point of like showing the crazy party, whatever? This is also like a very early, like number one placeholder kind of thing, which we did with Killers of the Flower Moon this yeah. year. And I do not think that's gonna win. And I think next time we're gonna have a more interesting number one. But the other interesting thing that, about what we just said here in this first 10 seconds, so much to dis dissect already, is that we were referencing very positive test screening reactions. And the word yeah. masterpiece was thrown around at the test screenings. And it is true that some people did love Babylon. Like, that's true. We didn't get a full spectrum of the opinions, but it was still kind of true some people had bad one. There have been test screening reactions that have seemed pretty indicative of ultimately like what the movie was yeah. that I can think of. But this year's really interesting because I feel like we've had a lot of movies that have test screened already. But to be honest, we are going off of those. Like Saltburn, has had really positive test screening reactions and it's made us very confident in that movie. What else has had positive test screening reactions? Barbie. I actually don't really like hearing about test screenings, even though I yeah, like it. Yeah, you fucking do. I really like it, but I don't like it because it takes away an element of mystery, but it also gives you like really good clues, but it almost feels OP. It almost feels too good. Huh. I also feel like Margot Robbie not getting nominated for lead. Like if I saw that Damn. movie early on, I would have thought, oh my God, she's but getting nominated. But that's the kind of shit where, especially when you get into like the acting categories, you look early in the year and you're like, no fucking way, you can't squeeze anything into this five. Yeah. And then it's like, it, it shakes up so much that there's like one or two. Yeah. Number two is Killers of the Flower Moon. I feel like we can skip this. This in a way makes our predictions probably like technically more accurate because this will probably get nominated next them. year. I feel more confident this year that the movies that we're predicting will come out. And I would have yeah. predicted Blitz if I was sure, but I'm not sure. Yeah. The Fablemans, which is another season. Fablemans, easy them. top three. Yeah, there, there's the juggernaut that like there, got there's, in. There's your guarantee. Like, Killers of the Flower Moon's nearly a guarantee this year. It still is. It feels like there's always like a huge movie that falls off. When your number one, two, and three is Chazelle, Spielberg, Scorsese, it's like, like a, they yeah. rarely like actually compete. Like they yeah. always like spread out in years and it feels a little more, there's yeah. more room to breathe. Can he make a Oscar bait film that doesn't get nominated? This is Steven Spielberg's That's true. Belfast. He, does. he it literally is can't. Autobiographical film. Probably everybody's gonna be supporting and the kid is gonna be lead. Lots of adults correct. giving. No, that wasn't correct because Michelle Williams was lead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I, yeah. yeah. You gotta know what you want in life. You have to be brave, little Steven. <laughs> I'm just, it's just, Nobody to me, it's that. Belfast, but Steven Spielberg's making it. This Another year. movie about movies, this and Babylon. And oh, third, and then Empire of Light. Yep, Empire of Light. The lesson is, of last year was almost that there were too many movies about movies that were released <laughs> to movies, and people were sick of it. The first reaction I heard from Empire of Light when it test screened was that this actually might not be the Oscar contender you think it is, guys. But then it was like, oh, it pulled well, though. Like, it got good ratings mm. from the test screening. But there really? was like one I don't remember these test screening that, rumors. Very interesting. Sam Mendes, a director, yes, he's had a couple Best Picture nominees, and he's had some movies like maybe Revolutionary Road or Road to Perdition that would have gotten in in a year of 10. And he just came off 1917. So he's pretty big. And he had Deacons no. and Olivia Coleman. Maybe like an Oppenheimer or even maybe yep. Lanthimos. It's like, yeah, they've been in the Oscar conversation, but you never really know if it's going to hit hard. It's unclear what this one's about, but it has to do with a cinema in the 80s in Britain. Maybe I could say this is one of the big contenders <laughs> that doesn't get it, but I'm like, I can't bet against that. Like Olivia Coleman, Roger Deakins, you can't deny 
those people anymore. I mean, after what they just did with 1917, they might be feeling pretty good. They might be feeling pretty warm. That's the other thing, too, is, like, he came off of a massive filmmaking achievement where he made a movie in quote-unquote one take. And then this movie wasn't really ambitious. Like, it was not ambitious when it came to how it was shot. When you hear a movie is not living up, you have to be willing to drop it from, like, way more categories than you're initially willing to. Even when the reviews came out and they were kind of bad, I remember a lot of, like, oh, but it'll still get, like, a few categories and, like, maybe it still gets in pictures and it was like, no. And then we were like, well, maybe it gets score in Olivia Coleman in cinematography. And it's like, not even Olivia Coleman, bro. Not even Deacon Hugh Sion. Jackman for the sun. Like, people don't really cling on. When the ship goes down, it's really hard to, like, clamor your way to the top. It's really difficult. It, Babylon still stayed on for three categories, but it ended up winning nothing. Number five is 13 Lives. Ron Howard oof, is that's kind of an oof. Is this is like predicting the boys in the boat from George Clooney this year, which is why I put that way lower, because I'm like, I'm not doing that This again. had good test screening reactions. That's what I remember. Audiences did like Audiences it. Audiences did like it. Actually, I do think that there's a there's a universe where 13 Lives could have dropped at a better time and had more of a campaign behind it and know. actually like done something because it actually does have like a 7.8 on IMDb. It's insane. I also think the problem with 13 Lives was, I guess that like the acting wasn't mandatory. Nothing was mandatory to nominate. And also predicting Ron Howard was a risk we shouldn't have taken. And we did it with Hillbilly Elegy It was too. a risk, yeah. We said, look at the cast. Maybe critics won't be on its side, but audiences are going to like it. It's not like predicting Ferrari. You know, it has Michael Mann. And Michael Mann <laughs> yeah, I has not agree. done like a ton of Oscars. I agree stuff. that it's, it would it would be like predicting Ferrari had one predict had we Ferrari. Had Ferrari, yeah. Like, top 10. This movie test screened and the studio reported the highest ratings they've ever gotten on a movie. That's probably why we did it. I don't think a lot of people were predicting this and sometimes we'll go out and we'll predict a movie that other people aren't predicting like uh, Next Goal Wins. We predicted that a couple mm, times yeah. in the top 10. It's still in here. And we're like, why isn't anyone predicting this? This seems good. And like I don't know where it comes from, but sometimes people are just right. They're like, we're not talking about it because it's not going to be anything. And then we're like, what, what? But, but it seems like it might be something. It's like, oh, TT, and then nothing happens. And that happened with 13 Lies. Like, it didn't really make a peep ever. It wasn't even really in people's predictions. I feel like we're not doing that this year. I think we're predicting a lot of stuff that people are, like, you know, talking about. Yeah. Now, at number six, we have The Sun. This is the follow-up oh, to The Father. Here we go. This is, this is where the cringe directed. begins. We just went off of the information we had. Well, The Father was good, so The Son will be good. And also, it has actors in it that are going to get nominated. The Son, I, I feel like maybe The Son was just too straightforward of a concept, whereas The Father did something cinematic, and it was kind of unclear. I don't think, like, oh, that's not the reason why No, the but I remember why The Son was unclear, like, oh, what are you going to be doing that is cinematic here, like you did in The Father that made everybody think it was really cool. But that's not why and The they Father... There was no answer to it. That's still not why The Father... Like, like, that's not the only reason like, why The Father is great. The Father was also Florian Zeller's only movie, so we were yeah. kind of like, oh, well, how does a guy direct that and then, you know, go on to make the next thing and it's whatever. I mean, it's not like the first movie is usually not an indication of how good of a director somebody is. It usually is. People often go up from there. It's like running a six minute mile and then you go to the next time around and, and it's like a 10 minute mile. It's like, what the fuck happened? This is like... The magical thing about this stuff, I don't know how it works. And I think it's just as confounding to me as an audience member as it probably is to Florian Zeller and the people who worked on the film. Why did the father work and this didn't? Like when you reverse engineer it and you look at the ingredients, it's actually very hard to like understand. After winning an Oscar for his first feature, which had incredible performances, and this film is another drama adapted from a play that he wrote, which by the way, I looked this up. This play that he wrote is is like lauded as a masterpiece. The Guardian is like glowing over this thing. So I have no reason to think this isn't gonna be great. Generally, I don't think source material is a good indicator. Sometimes bad source material makes good shit. And sometimes really good source material makes bad shit. And you could be very faithful to a good source material and it still just doesn't translate well to a film. And even when the director directs his own source material too. It's not a sequel to The Father. It has nothing to do with that. It's not affiliated with it. There's some misinformation out there because Hopkins is in the cast. I don't think oh, he's yeah. a significant person sequel. in the cast and he's certainly not reprising his role in any way. But big members of the cast, Hugh Jackman in the lead role. Now that's gonna be that's like, big. that's gonna be that's big. big. Laura Dern, all right? The performances are Still gonna be Still think Hugh Jackman should've gotten insane. nominated. Sorry, and everyone. <laughs> Vanessa Kirby. It's mainly about their their child, played by a newcomer, Zen McGrath, who's probably also gonna be really good. Hugh Jackman will definitely mm. get away with the lead place. So there was a point when people didn't know what to do with their top five, so they just started rocketing Zen McGrath uh, ever, up in there. Zen McGrath was, was looking at Gold Derby one night on his computer, and he thought, oh my God. 
Oh, I'm, that's oh, like a little, oh, like, yeah. I'm like, oh <laughs> man, poor kid. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I, I don't understand how we could get a bad film here. At seven? Huh. Just because you don't understand something you know, doesn't mean you My really mind know. expanded and my worldview grew. That's what happened. <laughs> Is Women Talking. This one's Women Talking was a pretty safe Sarah bet. Pauly, who doesn't I'm glad we went with too it. too often, but Away From Her was great. My sense is that this will be a little challenging. It's not going to be some Oscar bait thing, but the cast is freaking stacked. It looks like everybody's going to be going supporting in this movie. Unless McDormand doesn't want another nomination, they'll just throw her in lead. Thinking that McDormand was lead, ha! Huh? We could have just looked at the novel and figured that out, probably. Yeah, people who were paying attention early on would would soon figure out that Frances McDormand's not really big in it. Get screenplay and some actor nominated, but I'm less confident with Best Picture. Rest in peace to the actors of one of the best acted films of the year that did manage to get into Best Picture, like the weirdest thing ever. There's never been a movie that is women talking, in my opinion. In what terms do you mean? Of well, of, the, of that movie squeezing into Best Picture with all the actor and potential and then just none of it happens and like it, it just minimally gets nominated. That was just weird. Nightmare Alley. That's, That's like not the same thing. Nightmare Alley was a tech movie. This was getting was trying to get it off like of like acting, writing. And the directing was good. Women Talking though, I think was a good bet overall because it did have an awardsy cast. The subject matter was interesting. There was a lot of meat there. Sarah Pauly has good clout. I think it, yeah. it was a fair like, bet. Like she doesn't make bad movies, you know? At this point in the year, I remember predicting Women Talking felt like predicting Power of the Dog early in the yeah. year. I actually remember thinking it felt a little risky because it didn't come across as like the Fablemans, even though it's kind of awards bait and like MGM definitely like wanted awards with it. It strikes me like it might get more of a lost daughter package. Or is it Power of the Dog? Because we can also sense that this mm. is definitely going to be a festival movie. Like probably one of the movies. I think we thought it was going to be like too artsy. That was maybe you, you thought it. Yeah. And it's TIFF, Tyride, New York Film Festival. At number I was right that it was literally at every single film festival. Now here we go. We are at everything ever all at once at number eight. We were sheepish about it. We were sheepish. We're going for it. We're trying something. We're doing everything everywhere all at once. That's pretty ballsy. I, I don't even know if I feel confident about this. I'm kind of waiting and giving it like two weeks into a wide release maybe and then I would see how it's doing, see if people are watching it, see how much that- Right, because we didn't know if people were even gonna watch it. Once this movie became A24's highest grossing movie, you, you knew that it was like, Well, okay. the next predictions video, the next month we had it at number one. The next time we did predictions was I think in June. Once it did really well at the box office, we actually, we, we, we put it way up and then we were like thinking that like it could win screenplay. And then we were like, wait a second, it could win Best Picture. That's like the best thing that we've done. We were wave one of that bandwagon. You did have to wait for the box office though. You did have to wait for, like, it made a splash in a very unique yeah. way. That was a good affirmation for the movie. But people haven't learned this lesson until last year that if people care enough, you can get nominated, like, from early in the year, and there's no need oh, to be, like, because early, yeah. well, I don't know. That's another huge thing, that reason that people were sheepish. Letterbox obviously loves it. It has a 4.6. Well, okay, so it had a 4.6 on Letterbox. It was kind of bound to be, like, the highest rated movie of the year on Letterbox. Which is great. For, which is which really is great. Good. That's what you want. It's like past lives a little bit. Like, that's probably going to be, that's going to be top five. Uh, you know, John Wick has a 4.2. That's very good. John Wick did well at the box office. Yeah, I don't believe in that for Best Picture to be honest. John Wick doesn't have acting potential or or after I saw potential. John Wick, I was I was like I I don't actually think it's gonna get Oscars. I, I've been I was considering I I think it would be on my list like low down just in case. Yeah, I would say it's it's not impossible because of how people are responding to it. But I do yeah, agree. I don't I don't quite see everything everywhere. You know, you could say that it was weird and shit. It was a comedy. It was a sci-fi. It was an action. But like it had heart and it had really good performance. People felt seriously about it. Like it, like yeah. it, it, it sincerely changed their fucking life. And people were like, "How did this happen?" Like it, it changed people's life. <laughs> like that's how it happened. Everybody loves it. That's that's my argument. Is that everybody? They not only love it, but they really love it. And a lot of people are saying it's like one of the fa their, their favorite movies that they've seen in the past few years. People call it a cinematic achievement as well. And I mentioned this in the review. I think it crosses that line of lowbrow into highbrow. I think they actually very important people are talking about the film. Barbie as this work. That's of what art, Barbie's going to do. All, despite like the music video style of action. The fact that people are taking it so seriously is a testament to how good this thing is because it can cram all this weirdness into the film and you still buy it. You still cry at the end. A24 yeah. is slightly concerning because I think with them, if they don't go all in yeah. on the campaign, 
I think what we learned last year, people saying that, oh, A24 is shaky because they didn't get the movies nominated that I wanted to get nominated. They didn't get Come On, Come On or The Florida Project, and therefore A24 bad at campaigning cannot be trusted. I really don't think that that is why those movies got didn't get nominated. From what I've heard from people who, like, talk to A24, they tried to get stuff nominated. They, they wanted it to happen. But you can't just force a film in front of people's faces and they automatically vote for it. Like, no matter how good you think it is, it just has to hit in a certain way for people. And if it doesn't do that, you ain't got nothing. Netflix tried so hard to campaign Pinocchio, Glass Onion, e even like White mm -hmm, Noise, mm -hmm. even White Noise. They did a lot of work to get those movies nominations and it didn't work because people didn't respond to the movie. So it's not like, oh, Netflix bad at campaigning. Apparently All Quiet was more of an organic response. Yeah. I don't really appreciate like the argument of, you know, this studio is bad, this studio is good. You can't say that A24 is anything but as good at campaigning as everybody else yeah. at this point. The fact that this yeah. movie won seven Oscars, it was and the biggest won. Oscar sweep since Slumdog that's Millionaire. Our... Critics groups are gonna definitely nominate this movie at the end of the year. I do think that's gonna happen. I don't see how it wouldn't. This is gonna be one of the top three movies on Metacritic's compiled best films of the year. You know, so. that's why I'm confident that Past Lives is gonna work. When you start talking about like, this is gonna happen, it's, gonna, it's like, yeah, that's, well, that's pretty easy. That's pretty easy. You just follow the breadcrumbs. So what we did with Everything Everywhere that was, you know, good was that we followed the breadcrumbs. Well, okay, yeah, if it's in the top three for critics, which seems like it will happen, then, okay, they're gonna nominate the actors, they're gonna nominate the screenplay, and the then, editing. I don't think that you could have figured out that it was going to win four SAG awards and to best supporting actors nah. for Jamie Lee Curtis, nah. but. Nah. Cause a lot of number one votes like I see getting a lot of number one votes. Get Out was number one from February, and and then you know the critical yeah. acclaim. Get Out was a good precedent hype. for everything. Screenplay hype. This movie only gets better with me. The screenplay, the editing hype, the, the necessity. I, I will be if, if I if I see the screenplay being hyped up and winning awards, then I'm like, whoa, Best Picture, watch out, because I do think this screenplay should be nominated. And it feels like an Eternal Sunshine, you know, kind of Charlie Kaufman script. I don't know if Michelle Yeoh would be in my top five or not. I mean, that's obviously yikes. it's in picture that's very possible. Ki Hui Kwan, I think that even though- I don't remember like, thinking oh, no that she way. would win Like, all. I do think he could get a little critic support and then people will put him back on their list. Like, I feel like if we stop to think about it for a goddamn second, it's obvious if you nominate the movie for Best Picture that Michelle Yeoh's coming along. There's definitely a universe where this movie can get revived at the end of the year, and because yeah. people aren't going to forget it. Revived. Forget That's the thing. It didn't sure, even get revived. It was yeah, just like the kind of movie. It was just high the entire time, time, and then just got higher and higher. Cool. Number nine, I have Rustin. This is coming out this year, so we're not going to talk about it. Next goal wins is yeah. also coming out this year. Next goal wins has been coming out for so long that we're just like, yikes! They don't. They don't want it. They don't like it. This is called cringing, so we may as well listen to Canterbury Glass. This is really hard not to have in the top 10, but again, I can't stuff everything in there. This is David O. Russell. He's got a little blemish on his character, put it that way. Yeah, and that could affect the movie's reputation, or maybe the movie is just as good as The Fighter or Silver Linings Playbook or American Hustle. I have to say, Alexander Payne is in a, an extraordinarily similar situation to David O. Russell. Not only for what I just said, but Alexander Payne had like three movies in a row where he got nominated for picture and director. Yeah. And then he had a movie that people were like, no thanks. In David O. Russell's case, that's Joy. And then he came back with another movie and it took him like a while to make this next movie. I, I can mean, see people feeling like, oh, we're over. Alexander Payne. And I feel like people say we're over David O. Russell. However, nobody well, really had to confront like, oh, should we nominate David O. Russell? Because yeah. the movie was just not, was just I didn't bad. see it, but people just did not like it. So we were, they were like, well, we yeah. don't have to confront this at all. People are being fucking loud. It also, almost, this almost felt too big to me. It had Christian Bale lead role, Emmanuel Lebeski shooting it, David O. Russell, a massive fucking cast. It felt like overstuffed. It has stacked everything, like, but what is it at the core? Like, is there any reason to think that this movie will I think we mean anything to anybody? I think it was like a murder mystery Yeah, that should have been a red flag. I mean, yeah. well, we had it at 11, but I think it should have been a bigger red flag. Now, I'm a little surprised that you're number 12. I thought you were gonna keep this in the top 10. Bardo is fascinating. Bardo. Me. If we wanted to put international film in there and we were like, 
oh, well, there should be an international film in the top 10 because international films are, are often nominated. We would have just said Bardo was going to do it. I was thinking about how Decision to Leave seemed like the number one international film last year, and before that it was a hero early on in the year. You could say there's going to be an international film, but it's often hard to spot, and it's often something we don't quite expect. I want About Dry Grasses to be amazing, and I want the new Hayao Miyazaki movie to be amazing. But we just don't know. He's one of the most, if not the most, ambitious directors in Hollywood right now. You that was not to me untrue. How that no. film, tell me how that doesn't get director. It says Bardo is a nostalgic comedy set against an epic journey, a chronicle of uncertainties where the main character, a renowned Mexican journalist and documentary filmmaker, returns to his native country, facing his identity, familiar relationships, the folly of his memories, as well as the past and new reality of this country. We were kind of talking about this when we read the plot synopsis for All Dirt Road's Taste of Salt at Sundance, which was like kind of an anticipated one. You were like, when the plot is very ambiguous and it's talking about like the themes, like within the plot description, that can be an indication that the movie is just a little bit elusive and like that there isn't a strong plot. And that was true about Barter. Like that's why the plot was like, it's a nostalgic epic journey where the protagonist is dealing with regret and it's like well what's it about yeah here, here's a red flag for you an exploration of dream and memory and the reckoning of the past that would be a red flag for me if i read that in a plot description for a movie that was supposed to have oscar buzz i'd be like that doesn't sound like an oscar movie i'm sure in your redo has a lot that he wants to say in this film and it's not just going to be like some that's for sure ha -ha. yeah and it does sound personal she said it's just so obviously a movie that wants awards but you don't know exactly what to do with it because the director is not like david fincher this could be like another bombshell perhaps or it could be like spotlight it's very awards bait and it's likely nominee in screenplay i feel like that movie was riding off of the subject matter so much and it was like yeah it is about that it looks good on paper armageddon time it's like the bike riders with jeff nichols it's like he's doing a period movie with a stat cast but it's like the director hasn't registered that well with the academy before the whale 15 i mean that's that's pretty that's reasonable i almost got in it's not gonna be like some intense psychological portrait i'm sure there will be strokes of that i don't think it's gonna be like the fountain or mother and be like insane and inaccessible that's, that's the true. thing is i really don't think it's gonna be like that we already know the source material it's based on we think about who could win Best actor next year? We gotta think Brandon Fraser could win Best Actor next year. He really can. Good he really call. could for this. And I feel like he's really gonna bear his soul for this movie, and people are just gonna see it and be like, oh my god, I love Brandon Fraser. That's like, all very accurate. I'm so glad that he's back and giving this to us. Yeah, the more wrestler. along the lines of the wrestler than anything he's done. There's gotta be, I think, a supporting actor. Uh, actress contender Hong Chow performance. Hong Chow is going to be. We were more right here than we were like later when we started to predict Sadie. We Singh. had Hong Chow in the five early on, and then people started to say, "No, it's Sadie Sink. It's Sadie Sink." And then we backed out. But then it was actually Hong Chow. But then they and then they took off their masks and they're like Stranger Things fans. I'm like, uh, ah, you got us, you got us. But it was really Hong Chow. We have the killer here, which is this year. The Woman King ended up being around seventeen, I will say, or like maybe fifteen if you yeah. want, if you wanted. But it got no nomination so you'd probably say it was yeah. like 17 now. I guess that was a good call. It's kind of weird to have like people running around with swords these days. You know, those movies don't really get nominated like Napoleon. White Noise. Hard I think people had it people. higher because they were like, well, he just came off of Marriage Story and yeah. it's Adam Driver again and it's a huge budget and it's Netflix. But there was good reason to doubt that this was going to be accessible and we were right. Let's just say that we were right. We were that right. I okay, I was right because I did the research here. It yeah. was going to be a weird ass movie. You, you want and the a book movie. is weird and and it's very intellectual. Yeah, you want something that people are going to be able to understand and that's like translatable for people, or it has to be one of the very fucking most critically acclaimed films of the year. It was neither of those. Greatest beer ever. Hey, I mean that was, that movie went <laughs> nowhere. Yeah, nowhere. I mean, I saw it at the premiere. That was the most buzz it ever had. The critics were always going to hate this movie, man. They they yeah. were not going to be nice to Peter Farrelly after Green Book, even though they were kind of nice to him with Green Book. I mean, it wasn't a great movie either. Like, we'll be honest, it wasn't great. I don't know. I guess this was caution because we thought, well, Green Book seemed to come out out of nowhere, didn't it? And here we go. Here's our first like best picture nominee that actually happened that was like way down on our Nothing list. from 11 to 19. Yep. Nothing in that entire yep. range. And then Avatar 2 comes out. I guess obviously the signs were there in that we knew what it was. We knew what it was trying to live up to. And we just, we I guess we were doubtful that it would do it. This one's a total question mark. 
I mean, this has been in production for like over a freaking decade. I think they're gonna deliver something pretty phenomenal, visually at least. First, Avatar was criticized for having, you know, a pretty generic story, which is fair. Maybe Avatar 2 will kind of continue people's thoughts and they go, yeah, the story is like, okay, the visuals are amazing. Or maybe people will be reinvigorated and go, no, this is like, we don't care. Like, oh my God. Yeah, I think the problem with Avatar is that the sequels took so long that the legacy sort of tapered out and we don't really know where they're supposed to sit it. Everything we said up until this argument here was correct. We had the right sense about that the visuals were going to be revolutionary, and we even saw the possibility that people could just embrace it the same as the first one and be like, oh my god, it's back, and that, you know, it would make a lot of money. The argument I'm making here is like, people don't give a fuck about Avatar anymore, and people even wrote articles about that. Yeah, no one cares about Avatar anymore, by the way. Like, there's no legacy on that movie. This film did have to overcome that. I mean, it's no small feat, but it did do it. Whether or not I was part of this or not, like, it, it was silly and out of touch to say that the highest grossing movie ever didn't have any sort of impact and that nobody cared like that, that uh, that's just silly to say but a lot of people did see there being think effort were put into the story yeah. and they thought that that was an improvement that's kind of why I think it got in but it actually well, did also seem to just making a ton, of, end, money, did a ton of money did seem to be a number nine contender or number eight contender though at the end of the day and Avatar 1 was number two let me ask you something Will Avatar 3 be nominated? What the fuck are we going to do with Avatar 3? I think Avatar 3 actually won't get nominated, maybe. We're going to keep saying, like, no. We're just going to... Yeah, I don't know. Avatar Should I keep from... denying it? But, like, it, we, I mean, it's noticeable that Avatar was up here, Avatar 2 is here, and then maybe Avatar... Th not, not in terms of quality. <laughs> just follow the staircase. Just in terms of, like, where it ranked on the Oscar ladder, you know? But I feel like Avatar 3 will be the same as Avatar 2. I agree. That's the thing. It also, I think the gap between Avatar 1 and 2 almost made it feel like a legacy I feel sequel. like they might just stumble in because of 10 slots. They might all just be able to, like, stumble in there and get in. Because the next mm. one's going to make a lot of money. People really liked this movie. They went to see it, like, 10 times. But Avatar 2, I think the weight, that's not really going to be there for the next couple movies. Because they, they were all filmed at the same I don't time with the same technology. Because I think, I think no, I think it's like if you use the same technology and you transport people again, they're gonna be like, "Thanks, I w I'm, I'm gonna go see that again." Till it number twenty one is like accurate. I remember people n actually not paying attention to this movie very much at all. I remember being like, "Why aren't people talking about this?" Like at least in Best Actress, I still don't understand how she didn't get nominated. Because like, what the fuck? Like really, what the fuck? It was it was stupid. You know, shit. it's it's one of the it's one of the snubs that I'll just remember as hurting the most. And she got like sag and BAFTA too. She the only thing she missed was the, the Golden Globe. Which shouldn't matter. No, it shouldn't it matter. It should never matter. I mean, Yeojun Yoon won off that. Disgusting. Fucking Poor things will come out this year. We actually put this much higher. Sometimes when a movie just does a lap, like it just does one more lap and the next year it comes back and we're like, yeah, this. After last year, I'm gonna say weirdness is a good thing. Tar? I think Tar was hard to tell because obviously Todd Field came off of like 20 years of doing Yeah, nothing. but at the same time, Todd some, Field came off some of Some filmmakers do not get better with age. And I don't have to make like, the, I don't even have to provide examples. Like everyone knows. That. At the same time, Todd Field's movies got nominated for a whole lot of acting awards. All of them were nominated for screenplay. So he had a really good track record. This one is a biopic about a composer played by Kate Blanchett. I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, Kate Blanchett could easily be like, like in the best actress race, she's always incredible and she's probably gonna be undeniably good. I mean, Todd Field hasn't directed a film in a while, so we don't really like know what's up his sleeve right now. I believe that we embarrassingly did not have Kate Blanchett in the top five. It's kind of like, remember when nobody had Nicole Kidman in for being the Ricardos for a long time? And then randomly in like mm -hmm. September before, or like October, I was like, fuck it, like, on paper, this is too much. Like, we hmm. cannot ignore it. I don't care. And I put her in. Yeah. But I know, this I was like Kate Blanchett, the lead of a Todd Field film, shouldn't have denied that. What we learned with Tar is that Todd Field is not going to make a movie unless he really has something to say. Well, now he's saying that he's retired. And so if he ever comes back, yeah. if he ever comes back, don't you fucking dare deny it. I because. Wouldn't. He will be back for a reason. I think we just didn't know what it was. We were like, huh? No, we just didn't A movie know. about a composer, like, that's it's not, not a biopic, yeah. but feels like a biopic. Yep. Decision to leave. This is the second highest uh, international film on here. I think our main doubt was that it was a mystery. The director has never had a film that's been nominated for anything before. Of course, you know, people are kind of Still looking hasn't. at this and saying, could he have his Bong Joon-ho moment? The film is a, sort of a detective mystery. 
and yeah. that's not really up the Academy sleeve. They don't like mysteries oh, that much. Mysteries have been a red flag, and they were a red flag for Glass Onion as well. And, and they will continue to be. If the killer's a mystery, say goodbye. Oh, look who it is. It's our, it's our friend Elvis. Uh, it doesn't look amazing. I think there was a trailer. But what if there people was. love it, I guess, is your argument? Yeah, does it have to be amazing? Is the, like, it's trying it didn't to have be to be amazing. It didn't... Could there be a movie that is like exactly Bohemian Rhapsody and it happens again? I feel like probably not. The thing is that it wasn't Bohemian Rhapsody. There was a lot more talk in this movie about the director and the style, whereas Bohemian Rhapsody... Nobody fucking wanted to talk about the director at all. It was all. kind of Bohemian Rhapsody. It was, but it also wasn't. like, And it wasn't a repeat in terms of how it won. People were like, oh, it's going to win Golden Globes because Bohemian Rhapsody did. And Austin Butler is going to be Rami Malek. And it didn't really repeat. In fact, Elvis didn't win a single Oscar, which I'm still like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's weird. Austin Butler in the lead role, he will very likely get at least some buzz for playing Elvis. This is coming out in, I think, July, so... There's plenty of time for the buzz to fade down. Now you gotta say there's plenty of the time for the buzz to build up. Right next to I Want to Dance with Somebody, as if they were in the same league and mm -hmm. this movie got nothing. I think we have actually the same situation this year. We have a Bob Marley biopic that has the director of King Richard with Kingsley ben -Adir. And then we have the Back to Black movie about Amy Winehouse. Broker. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we were like trying to watch out for the international movies. And Hirokazu Koreeda has another movie this year called Monster. He does have another movie and called Monster. And people are doing the same thing already. They're like, oh yeah, like it could be his time. It's like, but just because you want it to be their time, it doesn't always happen like that as we saw with Decision to Leave. Needs to be your best film. Broker wasn't amazing. It was Shoplifter's Light. Like you do not win for making like yeah. your best Best movie light, which is often what happens after they come off their best movie. Asteroid City, that's this year. The Good Nurse, that this is just like, oh, just in case, because it has actors in it. Yep. But this was also kind of like a true crime sort of mystery thing that was like, yeah. it's not actually going to be, I'm sure we have stuff on this year that's like, oh, well, maybe, but then it's like, we, yeah. we secretly know deep down that it's Usually not. the, oh, well, maybe, like, there's actors in it, and but we don't really know the director. Cha-Cha Real Smooth. People thought, like, this is Coda again, but it's not. Shirley, that's this year. All Quiet on the West, here's All Quiet on the Western Front. I guess you weren't even part of this, Justin, because I think I must have added it later. Yeah. A couple contenders I forgot to mention. Number one, All Quiet on the Western Front. This is Netflix doing an adaptation of the classic novel All Quiet on the Western Front, which was adapted into the Best Picture winner from the 30s. I think it's been long enough since the original that it's not that weird that it's being remade. But again, it's, it's just another adaptation of the novel, not necessarily a remake of the movie. It looks like it's in black and white. Daniel Brühl's in it. We don't really know much about the director. So who knows? Maybe this is cinematography. Maybe this is sound. And then there's the zone of interest. I mean, it won those awards. Yeah, it was just a question mark, I think. Like, we barely, we just learned about it. Just not knowing anything about the director and the only cast member being, like, Daniel Brühl. And Daniel Brühl didn't factor in, like, whatsoever to anything, any part of this movie. You know, maybe the lesson with that one is that if you have a big budget behind a war movie, the Oscars might not be able to contain I think it's themselves. just, yeah, I think it's just the war movie thing. Oh, Banshees is so low. Yeah, My I God. was waiting for it. I guess we'll have to watch why we're wrong. And this is like a reunion film. I'm sure it will have an identity of its own. Uh, it's another dark comedy, I'm pretty sure. It's about like two friends who are having some sort of fallout. I feel like maybe this movie being more of just like a reunion of In Bruges. I just don't know if I'm gonna predict him to repeat his success again. Screenplay. Perhaps. Yeah, it seems like it'll be a very good movie. I don't know if people will be wanting to nominate it for Best Picture. I th remember thinking, oh, he's just like having fun and making like a, a, a well-made dark comedy. I, I think know comedy was like what we got hung up on. I also think it got hung up on the In Bruges reunion. It's like, oh, it is an In Bruges reunion. So they're just like having fun together. They're getting back together and having fun. But what they did was they made like a really original movie that felt completely different. And yeah, but it was also hard to see what the story was going to be because it's the, the story is like a friend breakup, you know? You yeah, don't read yeah. that plot and go, that was, that's for the Oscars. You know, I would say that this and Tar, they had a filmmaker who had movies nominated. Like you yeah. could have seen it. Like you could have seen it coming. This but... is the stuff that haunts me at night is like the fact <laughs> that the Banshees and Tar are like really, they're below 20 on our list. It's like, what are the movies that are below 20 that, you know, we're just underestimating that are going to pop up? Like, I get that I didn't see All Quiet. I get that I didn't see Top Gun coming, but... You could have seen Banshees and Tar coming because of the actors and the potential for screenplay and, and, and yeah. on and on. By the way, Top Gun is just not here. 
There's no mention of Top yeah. Gun anywhere. Triangle of Sadness is also not here, which is weird because Triangle of Sadness we did have in our year prior as predictions. Triangle of Sadness was like my number no, 30 No, but we knew what that before. was. I know, but I was just kind of like, okay, I know what it is. It's going to can, whatever. Yeah. That was kind of my thought. But that was an instance where, you know, Ruben Östlund, like, you, people know who he is. He's on people's radar. He made an English language movie. That that's, doesn't that's always happen, that. though. Definitely worth having on the radar, yeah. you know. And he yeah. was consistent and he was on like a high his last two movies right. were like top gun i mean what are you gonna do what are you gonna say oh we should have seen that coming and now this year we're gonna predict indiana jones 4 like absolutely not we're not gonna we're absolutely not we're gonna not gonna do that i don't know if there was a way to see it coming like they're just literally like it, it was gonna be a good summer blockbuster at best mm -hmm. but you know what it had was nostalgia style significance in terms of like what it represented to movies and to blockbuster cinema and the state of yeah, movies. Yeah, but you wouldn't see that coming. You even. wouldn't see it you coming. You would just see like rehashed like old movies that are, you know, just IP that's being beaten to death. That's all I see but, when but, I look at but, movies like that. I don't think that it looks care it looked carelessly made because they were doing like the whole cameras and the planes thing and but like do we know that we didn't even yeah there was what? a trailer for it we just didn't there? It. you and me just did not fucking pay attention i'm sure that like i wouldn't even have watched the trailer I'd be yeah like, oh, we, we, we probably literally didn't care and then suddenly <laughs> the reactions out of like the first screening are like guys this might be a best picture thing who called that jeff snyder it was a good call the people who saw it and immediately said it'll get nominated that was a good call that was a really good call because even when i saw it i was still i think we've had it at 15 actually the video after we saw Top Gun Maverick. We said, hey, maybe, but I'm not really convinced. Even Triangle of Sadness, after seeing that at Cannes, I was like, I'm not gonna say never. And I remember in my review, I said it could get the Licorice Pizza 3 at best, which is what it did. I think this year, I'm gonna have to force myself to predict something from Cannes that's not Killers of the Flower Moon. You know, if Poor Things or May December is there, maybe I, they I would like either. to reserve a slot for something at Cannes. You need to get that out of me. If I'm like refusing to budge and I'm like, I just don't really know. But you wanted to put Worst Person in the World in. So if this were oh, a, yeah. that year, we would have put that in and been wrong and it was actually Drive My Car. I would have never did, fucking We did not drive think my, nobody. Drive My Car was getting nominated. I thought Drive My Car was not going to get nominated for international feature. It was a very weird situation. Yep. I still don't know why Worst Person couldn't have been an international contender. I, I still I feel either. like on the surface, I would think that that might have a little yeah. more appeal. A little more of like a fast paced movie. I, I feel like there, there, there's a universe where Worst Person in the World got nominated for Oscars and we're just unfortunately not in that universe. Yeah. Don't worry, darling. It's not embarrassing that we had it on at 35. Because a lot of people had it higher. Yeah, this seemed too, movie. like, yeah, young like Twitter, novel. letterbox, And also, we foresaw the problem, and I guarantee we say it in this video. It's obvious what the movie's going for in terms of what kind of social commentary. And, yeah. no, too, too and, and nobody, and that was exactly what people didn't like about it. They thought it was too obvious. The Batman. I remember some people were, like, kind of trying to say that this was going to get nominated, but... It, well, it, it after was... it came out, no. And this is after it came out. I think before it came out, we were very open to it, though. I yeah. remember saying that the cap is three, and that I was never going to predict more than three. And yet, I did cave, and I predicted four because of how many cinematography nominations it was getting. I did predict it for cinematography, and I was wrong. Mm. The Lost King, that's just that's just embarrassing. That's cringe. The Lost King's like, we may as well throw this in there. A Man Called Otto? Nope. Pretty low. It's very not confident to have it yeah. below A Man Called Otto, but just too yeah, genre yeah, the genre an problem. alien movie. But the genre did hold it back. I, I think that's true. And it did get no nominations. Bones and All, Blonde. People were kind of yelling about us not having this higher. I remember we had Ana de Armas at like 20, though. I swear to God, mm. we had her at like 20. We were like, well, they no. were right. I mean, people were imploring us to take her seriously, even after the movie came out, to like shit, kind of shit reviews. We never took her seriously. I think the year before this, we had her at number one. Then we had indication that it was going to be fucking nuts, and then we just took it off. Yeah. I just still feel like it was weird that she actually got in. It was weird. 3,000 Years of Longing. I heard bad word about this movie, more than just her. Let's look at our Oscar scores from throughout the year. Out of the earliest predictions that we did in April, where we predicted the lead acting categories, supporting categories, and best picture, we were 20% accurate. 20% accurate mm. with our predictions. Very bad. I feel like we'll, we'll do better this year, but I always think that. I think we did better the two years before this, if I'm not mistaken. In June, where we had, you know, most categories, we were literally like right in one or two categories. At the beginning of the year, would you like to know which ones we were writing three? I have all these stored on my computer. I have all 
the predictions that we ever made and how accurate we were. We got three out of five in production design. Let's just give ourselves a round of applause for what we can. And to be fair, everything that actually came out got nominated. Technically, if you bump that down, you put Empire of Light and Elvis in, we got four out of five. Technically, oh, yeah. if you want to be really nice. Oh, yeah. Part of the reason that our predictions were so bad is because Killers of the Flower Moon is in there kind of polluting it because you have that in pretty much every category and it's not right. We're 38% in June. 48% in August. By September, I think this was after TIFF, we got 61%, which you'd think like, oh, TIFF clears up so much, we're gonna know so much. Fascinatingly enough, we did have All Quiet on the Western Front in for Best Picture. Oh. And then we moved it and we took it down because- We still didn't have Elvis in. I know we didn't have Elvis Triangle in. Triangle 11 was, and was Avatar close. 14. So like, all the other films are getting close though. You know, they're really encroaching. This was actually pretty good. What were we like? We, up, we, we were seven up. out of 10 here. Seven out of 10 at TIFF, so that's fine. And everything's in top 15 actually. Yeah, but look at November, like all quiet, like literally left the chat. Like yeah. we thought that's done. We were also seven out of 10 in November. So technically no improvements. We caved on Avatar, but we moved all quiet out. It's funny because I remember thinking we were so confident in this top eight and yet the whale gone. Babylon at number four, gone. Women Talking almost didn't get in. So that shouldn't have been something we were like super confident in. Also, right after TIFF, we had Women Talking in the top three. Triangle of Sadness in June, I had it at 19 and I had seen it at this point. I had seen it and it was still 19. We were three out of 10 in June. We were also three out of 10 in March when we made this video. So we didn't improve even though can happened. Even though Top Gun was out and Elvis was seen by me and Triangle of Sadness was seen by me, we did not predict those movies. There were three movies that I had seen at this point that I wasn't predicting in Best Picture. Kind of fascinating. We really got to pay attention to some of the early stuff. But in November, we were 64%. Slight improvement over September. Then by December, we have an even greater improvement, which I think comes because the, the, this is where the Critics Awards start chiming in and you see which campaigns are starting to take off except for all quiet which was in completely invisible in december for best picture we literally took all quiet on the western front out we just said that's that doesn't seem to be working and this is where we put rr in because this is after critics choice we were eight out of ten eight out of ten in december we were also eight out of ten in our final predictions. In our final predictions, we got 79%. If you want to click quickly look at the acting categories, for supporting actress, it was almost just a futile video to make. We had two people who even got nominated and they weren't in the top five. We were zero out of five. Hong Chao was the closest we were to getting anybody right. Didn't get Jesse Buckley. Michelle Williams moved. Lily Gladstone is this year. Stephanie Hsu, we saw the movie. And we, we still said, no way. And guess who's not here? Jamie Lee Curtis ain't even here. We also didn't have Angela Bassett. I mean, who could have seen Angela Bassett for Wakanda forever? I don't know. Carrie Conan for Banshees, also not here. And I remember in the April prediction video, we were like, it has crossed my mind that everything everywhere could be number one. Kihoi Kwan was number one for best actor. I guess that's a pretty good call, but he's also just like supporting actress. There's only two people on here who even got nominated. One of them is brighter than Tyree Henry, who we probably thought that was like a long shot. We probably thought that's just one of those things that you have on as like a precaution. And yet he is in. Paul Dano for Failman's was like pretty close. Didn't have Judd Hirsch. And yet with lead, how much better were we really? Brendan Fraser, we had a three. Austin Butler, 13. We got him. Austin Butler, 13, even though he was playing Elvis. We just thought that movie would be like... You know, you really can't underestimate the historical figures that are really importantly Elvis and Blonde. And Bob Error. Marley, perhaps. And Marilyn Monroe. Bill Nye, we thought like, okay, fine, he's getting buzz, and I'll we, put we, him on. We, we saw that movie too. We saw the movie, yeah. We uh, did not believe There's a lot of examples all. where we see the movie and it's just blind. Blind. Yeah, even that, 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 that also shoot. haunts me at night. That's also something that I, uh, you know, really struggle with. Well, good thing we have two movies we've seen on the list right now. That's why I'm like. I don't want to put air in, but I will put air in because I don't want to be wrong. I, I will just put air in the, in the list. Yes. John Wick's getting nominated for Best Picture. No, it's not. I'm just kidding. But am I? But am I? Paul Mescal, nobody could have seen After Sun. It makes me wonder if there's something at Sundance that we missed, or, like that, that we should have seen coming. I don't think so. Though. I really would like if a thousand and one got some nominee, like acting nominations of the award, Academy Awards, but it won't. We didn't even have Colin Farrell on the list. Didn't even put him at the bottom of the list. I just thought, okay, that's a comedy. Colin Farrell doesn't get nominated for stuff like that. Lead actress, Michelle Yeoh was correct. We were correct about Michelle Yeoh and that was it. Deadweiler at two, that's still a good call. I'm not, that's not, no cringe there. Everybody thought she was getting him. Olivia Coleman, how could you not think that Viola that was Davis, happening? Davis, very close. Kate Blanchett, there were enough signs we could have done that. Ana de Armas, we thought, fuck no. Some of these are just comical. 
And then Michelle Williams, we thought she was supporting. If she was in Lilo, to be fair, we would have had her pretty high. Yeah. And Andrea Riseborough, nobody not for saw miles, that not for miles. No. So technically, you know, if you're being really charitable, we did okay in that category. Every single acting category, at least two people weren't on the list. I mean, Michelle Williams kind of counts because yeah. she was in another category, but really, like. You know, we, we, we got our list. Terrifying. We got terrifying. our predictions Scary. ready to go for the acting categories right now. And, like, just thinking that, like, there's going to be people that aren't even, that we don't even, we're not even thinking about them. And that is us cringing at our predictions. Did we cringe? I think we, I think we cringed. Do you sometimes. feel bad about yourself? Do you feel like you're not no, an expert? I mean, I think it's you learning and growing as a, as a person. I feel a little bit taller. Do you think you've grown? I think I probably grew, like, a quarter of an inch. Hopefully we don't have as many movies this year in like every category that are just not coming out. Now that we've looked at this video, we're going to be prepared for this year. We're going to be well prepared. Mm. We're not going to miss a thing. Nothing's going to happen that we don't expect. Stay tuned for our acting predictions, which we, as you have seen from this video, will be right. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Which film got into Best Picture that you were the most surprised about?